Welcome to Untold Stories of Innovation, where we amplify untold stories of insight, impact, and innovation. Powered by Untold Content, I'm your host, Katie Trout taylor Our guest today is Michael Kanan. He is the author of the new book, T-Minus AI. He's also Director of Operations at the U.S. Air Force MIT Artificial Intelligence Accelerator. Michael, I'm so grateful to have you on the podcast to discuss artificial intelligence and innovation storytelling. I'm grateful to be here with you, Katie. Uh, I mentioned this when we first hopped on our call just now, but I have had my nose in your book for the last several days. I am devouring it. I'm about 10 pages from being finished, so you'll have to help clue me in on how it ends. But it is such a a powerful read, T-minus AI. It's just out, um, and it really covers everything we need to know about artificial intelligence, even for those of us in the innovation community who may not work really intimately or directly with AI, it just leaves us with a very clear understanding of its implications um, and what it, what it's, what's constituted, what's, what's kind of counts as AI and what doesn't and what we ought to be paying attention to. Yeah. And that, and that was the goal for the book. I mean, we're talking about a technology that is ubiquitous to every interaction of our lives and that will only, you know, grow over the years to come. So what I wanted to do in the book was bring that in a very human anecdotal format. If you wanna talk about artificial intelligence, you kind of have to know a little bit about evolution, our biology, the scales of numbers, both big and small, how they impact us, some basics of how a computer works, of course, language, uh, our brains learning. And then let's get to what is AI? How does it work for us? Because without the context, the conversation is too often lacking and lacking in in, in depth and coming from a common foundation and a clear understanding of what it is. And then what we talk about every day, AI in competition, AI in business, AI in international relations. So I want to break it up into three parts of the book that were told in that way so that regardless of who you are, there's something individually meaningful to you. Yes. Well, you accomplished it. And I strongly recommend anyone listening to this conversation to read the book. One of the things that I love, and perhaps this is my uh, flaw as a former English professor, right, is that you get into the human psyche, into human history, and talk about how machines sh- machines, and artificial intelligence have to reflect human intelligence and how we think and how we talk. Um, and one of my favorite parts was how you sort of compare the origins of math to the origins of storytelling. Yeah, numbers and language and storytelling are inexorably linked. They're they're very similar topics and they're uh, ones that, you know, kind of a chicken and the egg problem, which one came first. But I think they come together and what what you want to do is expose people through storytelling. Humans learn best through storytelling. And that was, you know, uh, what I hope to get across. And I'm so happy that that you received that. Yeah. And of course, then the book dives really deeply into why uh, we should be paying attention to AI on a global scale. Who owns it? What are the, the risks, threats, and opportunities? Um, and, and so I would love to I'd love to, though, but before we kind of dive into to all of that, to hear your personal story of innovation, you know, what got you into the world of AI? Well, maybe it goes all the way back to when I wasn't alive in 1956. AI has been a topic that that has long been discussed and debated. And in 1956 at Dartmouth, a group of really brilliant people got together and they could see what was possible in the future with the rise of machines, data, the way that we can memorialize everything around us. And they set a definition of artificial intelligence. They said, a computer performing a task that was once deemed in the human domain. When you think about that definition though, you can understand that since 1956, we've anthropomorphized so much of what AI is and keep kicking the can down the road because based off that definition, then surely a calculator was artificial intelligence. Right. Then the TI-84 pluses that we had was an even better one. <laughs> then Excel, nowadays Tableau. Right. And, and we just keep kicking the can down the road. So for myself, as we kept kicking that can down the road, I came into uh, working at the National Air and Space Intelligence Center 
when AI came out of what I think is its last winter in about 2011. In 2011, once again, we said AI isn't real, but because of the rise in our ability to collect data, cloud and everything else, some advancements in computing architectures, some new math and software, right? Math expressed in software. Machine learning came into being and it worked. And at that point in time, it was the ImageNet competition. Mm -hmm. Now the goal is with this ImageNet competition is to put a bunch of pictures on the internet, grab a bunch from the internet, put in a database somewhere. Generally it's like cats and things, right? Because everything on the internet's cats. And then run <laughs> the computer against the human. And in 2011 was the first time that the computer could outperform the human in these discrete tasks. Mm. Voila, here we are, the machine learning age. Now, at the same point in time in 2011, as I mentioned, I was at the National Air and Space Intelligence Center. And I was responsible for a mission called ACES High. And it was a hyperspectral imager. So this is going to get nerdy, but I'll try to I make love it. I love it. Yeah, let's dive in. <laughs> okay, so it's a hyperspectral imager. You and I see in three color bands. A mantis shrimp sees in something like eight or nine. There's a philosophical conversation we could have is, what does the mantis shrimp see that I do not, right? <laughs> right. But this hyperspectral imager, it could see in hundreds of color bands. Mm. So we were running operations from the National Air and Space Intelligence Center in the Middle East, in Afghanistan. And we put this on one of our unmanned aircraft. And our goal was based off of this imager collecting and the reflectance of light hitting the ground from the sun. Because there are so many color bands it's collecting in, then if something is spectrally significant in certain color bands, then you could deduce or identify what that material is. Think of, you know, homemade explosives and the like. Yeah. Right. So our goal was to run this mission and it is solely to save American lives. Mm -hmm. Essentially say, wait a second, don't turn down that street because yeah. something is there. And we were wildly successful. The team, an incredible group of individuals who took this new fangled machine and we had to make it work for us, right? About 30, 40 people, brilliant minds, and really successful. But at the same time, this image net thing is going on. And while it maybe took us a certain amount of time to be able to alert people to what was happening on the ground, I said to myself, wait, but what about this artificial intelligence thing? This could surely make us do that faster or more precisely. And in 2011, as is still the case, most people say, mm, I don't know about that AI thing. It's not real AI, right? So my love of artificial intelligence truly came from, and, and why I moved down this path, is from a place of need. Mm -hmm to do something for someone else in the name of customer service, in the name of service in general. And from that point in time, it's been a nine year long journey to the point we're at now, where, where I think the world is opening its eyes to its seriousness, its applicability to their everyday life and how it influences them. But when it comes to a story of innovation, right? So that's a story of artificial intelligence. That's just my personal story. But when it comes to innovation, we have an innovator's dilemma that I often think about. The dilemma is, I want things to change. I am unhappy with the current state of being, or the current state of being could be better. But I'm reminded of a quote, the limits of my language mean the limits of my world. So as innovators, we still have to be able to communicate. I think of the idea of taking the ideas of the new and blending it with the techniques of the old because you can't just do it alone. And by the way, nobody appreciates just malware in the system, right? Without a goal. So sometimes for innovators, what I think is important is to help yourself, help yourself, right? To speak that language to, you know, the overused term hashtag, okay, boomers, <laughs> but we have to be able to communicate with them. 
because otherwise it's just noise in the system. So one, one, one common, common foundation or common denominator to everything was always someone who is a champion, someone alongside of you, right? And I think that that's important for innovators to remember that you're going to stress yourself out unless you're speaking the language of the people that you want to change. The best way to hack a bureaucracy is to understand a bureaucracy. Yeah, absolutely. So thank you so much. It's it's exciting to hear what led you to the work that you do today and some of those successful missions that you've accomplished. And and then generally just to hear your perspectives on storytelling and the role that it plays and helping people get buy-in and traction and, as you say, speak the same language. I really appreciate that. Um, and I think, you know, that you shared a couple of examples already, but on page 128 and 129 of your book, you have this nice table where you outline the many different sectors and the ways in which artificial intelligence has, holds the potential to make an impact and, and create good. Everything from you know pharmaceutical research and development to retail inventory and pricing and DNA sequencing and classification or um, you know aerospace research, climate analysis, and it, it, the list goes on and on. But I'd love to hear some more of your favorite innovation stories around AI that get you excited about the future. And then we'll talk about the dark side too. Oh, sure. <laughs> um, I'm glad we're going to the, to the light side to begin with. Right? Yes, yes. Um, in a very meta way, AI is all about innovation. Right? Our goal when we're doing an artificial intelligence project or bringing it into our organizations is simply this. Ask new questions. We don't always think about that because these words automation and AI are too interchangeably used and stuff like that all the time. And AI gets a bad rap. We think that it's going to replace the bottom of our workforce. That's incorrect. Totally incorrect. You won't have a successful AI project. In fact, what you should do is move to the top of your workforce, your subject matter experts, the best people you have. And what you want to do is you want to start looking at the world through the lens of AI. So I'll give you an example. In your life, you wanna think about something you do all the time, right? That you are highly accurate on, right? You have to be accurate with that prediction, with that task, with that due out, with that balancing the budget, the book, whatever it is in your personal life. Everyone has some, right? Something that ideally moves at high speed, like quick decisions are made. So high accuracy, high speed, and then the other one, high volumes of data. Like you're looking at a lot of stuff. Think about case law, right? And precedents. You know, we have all of these attributes to certain jobs in our lives, right? So what you want to do is you want to find all these examples or the data that you have, right? Put that all together and you say, wow, I have this highly represented uh, data set that is a lot of examples of what I do, okay? And then here's the, uh, here's the rule though. Imagine if you will, that artificial intelligence isn't real. It's not, a, it's not a thing. It's just this island of IT people who are capable of taking on all your tasks. But the rule is you can't give them directions, only the examples we just talked about. If you do those two things and think with this kind of, you know, nuanced paradigm shift that I don't mean to be pedantic in any way, then you found your AI problems because what ends up happening? You take that representative data, you give it to, you know, that software, the imaginary AI, of course, and what does it do? It illuminates insights. The very purpose of machine learning is to discover human patterns. So when I think about what's your favorite story on innovation, well, by asking a new question, it's simply that. It's exactly that whole process. And I also like talking about AI uh, or uh, innovation in some different ways as well. Often we, we kind of umbrella everything. Everything is innovation. But it can be a singular noun too. An innovation on the system. A new question that you're asking. So as it comes to what's the good of it, I think it can make us be more human. I think we can get out of computer tasks that saturate our lives. Our jobs are too often computer jobs. 
And by the way, if an AI or automation could replace your job or someone in your workforce, well, that person shouldn't be doing that job, right? That's, that's not a person job. So when we talk about the good, it's all about asking new questions. And I think that's special, particularly at this moment in time, where we need to do that in society. And AI can help us get there. I love that. Thank you so much for sharing. And you go into this idea in the book about how AI or machine learning, what really drives it is the data that we put into it. And so one of the things that I love is you know, people, when it comes to artificial intelligence, they can feel like it's a very large concept, very far away from them, right? It's this idea of robots taking over the world. And uh, you really kind of contrast that in this book and say, that's fine. You know, I'm not saying those, those conversations aren't valid, but if you've got a fire at your door and there are immediate issues to resolve when it comes to the way that AI is capable of making things happen right now, then that's where we need to be focused. And that's, that's where we can either leverage it for good or protect against its misuses. Exactly. When there's a fire at the door, you're not so much worried about the lightning in the distance. Right. right. Every day I have conversations about, well, what about the killer robots? What about the artificial intelligence on weapons? Mm -hmm. What about X, Y, whatever it may be? When today, the current state of artificial intelligence is creating dystopian societies. It's biasing against people. It's affecting hiring actions. You know, for, I know we're not on a video, you and I are on a video right now, but it's just hiring more old white guys like myself. Oh my gosh. That was one of the most powerful examples in the book. There's, uh, oh my goodness. Okay. If you can't read any uh, thing except for like one chapter, read bias in the machine. I loved that chapter so much. And, and uh, could you dive into the the Twitter Tay, Microsoft Tay example and the Amazon hiring? Or I can even repeat it back because I read it again this morning. I love it so much, <laughs> not to put you on the spot. But this idea of, you know, and this is a little bit getting into the dark side of things, but with machine learning come the same human biases, potentially, that we put into the research and the questions that we posed. The question, the way we pose it, has an impact on the data that gets collected as a result. And then our analysis can also be full uh, of potential bias. And one of the great examples you share is, um, is, is Am- Amazon had a hiring algorithm around resume reading. Yeah. I, 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 AI is like looking in a mirror, period. Right. I think, I think to a certain degree, there's a subconscious aversion or distaste to knowing we're about to look in the mirror, even if you don't quite <laughs> understand it. Sure. And all it's going to do is reflect and formulate predictions of the current state of affairs. So in a good so this can be very good though, right? Because what's the difference? Is that when Amazon identified that they were hiring many older white gentlemen and just biasing against that. It's like, well, of course they were. I mean, that's what many of our companies look like right now. We're trying to get past that in society. But the difference was is they were held to account, right? The difference is, is that people say that is unacceptable and we must change. When it came to Microsoft Tay, which was, by the way, for people listening, it was a Twitter bot that collected a whole bunch of of essentially how we interact as humans. And surprise, it was uh, basically the worst of us, Yeah. right? It was absolutely the worst of us. Yeah, Very depressed. The, Very, the algorithm uh, was, yeah, the, the algorithm driving this sort of 19 year old mm-hmm. profile bot named Tay was, mm-hmm. her algorithm was really only based on the comments that she would get on her right. Twitter, on her tweets. And so within hours, Tay was putting out racist and sexist mm-hmm. tweets uh, because those were the comments that were coming back on her first or, you know, her earliest tweets. Her, her, her first hello world, right? So, yes. So that's, you know, we're talking about, what we're talking about here is, again, back to the point. Machine learning applications are only designed to analyze data and formulate predictions without guidance from us. But because it's just based on data, which again is a reflection of us, data has always existed, right? It's just now we memorialize them. Like the tree that falls in a forest, does it make a sound? Well, of course it does. The question is, was something there to record it? Nowadays, we have everything to record it. 
So if an algorithm's analysis is just based on data, it doesn't mean its output will be neutral or objectively fair because biases will be reflected in our data when they are. It stands to reason that every subsequent strategy analysis or prediction based on the data will be biased as well. And then if we make decisions to those answers to those questions, then of course the underlying biases will of course perpetuate in all of our lives. And most of us do believe at the core of the matter that we're fully aware and consciously in control of bias inclinations and opinions, and we can intentionally include or exclude them however we see fit during a never ending day of decisions, like not walking in front of a car, right? Mm -hmm. You're biased against that. That's <laughs> not a good idea, but we're not, or the fact I don't like olives, we're unable to separate ourselves from our biases or our biases from ourselves, right? To get philosophical. And we're not even aware of the prejudices we hold. And we're unaware of the many ways they influence our behavior in answering those questions. So regardless of how objective, unbiased, or enlightened each of us think we are, we have tendencies and tastes, aversions and distastes. It defines who we are. So the point is, when we're moving forward on an AI project in your organization or anyone, you have to have representation of everyone to ask those questions up front. What could be the tertiary side effects of this? And I think that's what is special and why AI should be a topic for everyone. The future rock stars in artificial intelligence are ethicists and lawyers and teachers and parents, right? So many more people need to be involved at the beginning. And it's not just for those IT people because the questions we're trying to solve and the questions we ask are really important. Now, back to the point, though, of was Tay or the Amazon hiring bad? In the long term, I don't think so. I don't think it was necessarily bad. I think it was a good thing. I think it illuminated something that perhaps we thought was true, we found out is true, and we changed. They still do not have that algorithm in practice, and Tay doesn't exist anymore. Right. In other countries, though, and I'm looking at you, China and Russia and some other places, they don't get to say no. They don't get to say that's unfair. And by the way, I should rephrase. I'm looking at you, Chinese Communist Party, you Russian Federation, right? Not right. the Chinese people, not Russian citizens. Right. Right. And they don't get a say in those questions. So I think it would be it would be a travesty with the rights that we're afforded here to not hold people to account, to not understand it, at least to the extent that we can communicate about it, to ask better questions, so that we don't become more like that. That's and right. I think that's yeah. what's special right now. Absolutely. You know, the fact that when the hiring algorithm at Amazon, when it was discovered that it was pushing more women's resumes to the side and elevating men's resumes, just because the machine learning looked at the history of data of hiring and saw that there were more male resumes and therefore it interpreted that as being desirable. Um, and it perpetuated it, not unlike the way that we did as humans for decades and decades. And so, but you're right. I, I think there's something really powerful about that metaphor you said, holding a mirror up to ourselves. And, and the great end result of that is that Amazon no longer uses that algorithm. Or if they will build one in the future, they will try to accommodate or, or, or change based on those biases. And you're bringing us to a, perhaps the most critical part of your book, which is when, when companies and institutions are utilizing artificial intelligence in a globalized way, um, even if those companies are sort of uh, headquartered in different countries, the ways that that, that, uh, that innovation is put to use in different cultures and contexts can differ and the rules and the regulations um, protecting against security and safety threats are also different. So can you speak to you know, that aspect of AI and what we should be paying attention to? Well, it's the question of, and I and I think I think we're of course just going to leap ahead a little bit. Is who really is responsible for making these choices? 
Is it the developer who made the AI and then put it on GitHub and then somebody did something wrong with it, right? Because its worldview or the data that it was fed was not representative of its scope of impact. I think of it like an X and Y axis, right? So on the Y axis, we have that labeled as worldview, right? Or data, because data is akin to experience for a machine, because that's how, how we learn, right? Just through experience. Yes. On the X axis, you would have its scope of application. How many people is that affecting? In which way? And is its worldview fair, representative? of the number of people it's impacting. So how would this play out in real life? The question is, I certainly don't want an Alexa or Google Home in my home that was only trained on Southern white gentlemen or people only from Northern California because its scope of application is broader than that, right? It's in everyone's home. Now, if it was just, you know, this wouldn't be an AI solution, but like a telephone switch operator or something, right? Then then fine, maybe its worldview doesn't need to be very large to perform that action. So when you start kind of mapping out where things fall on the X and Y axis, while we deal with, you know, explainability and all these anthropomorphized words of, well, why did they I make that decision and how do we debias things and whatever, at least we can start saying, no, I think that's fair to its scope of of influence or the scope of impact, right? And then when it comes to, well, then the question is, when it's used poorly, whose fault? The person who made it, the company who owns it, you know, on whatever platform or software they have? Uh, is it the government? The qu- Sometimes when we talk about AI, it's like we throw the kitchen sink and the whole kitchen out the window. <laughs> if you... Right. If you kill someone with a hammer, it is not the fault of Ace Hardware <laughs> or, or of Black & Decker right. or whoever made the hammer. It is you. It is what you do with it. It is what your organization did with it, right? And we have to be accountable for those things. So the way that you see this play out, you know, broadly is, well, in different places, they have different biases. Again, bias isn't necessarily a bad thing. You don't want to de-bias everything, right? If I if I don't like olives, I don't want to bias out of my algorithm that I don't like olives and I start cooking olive-filled dishes, right? We just have to make sure that it's fair. But what I think is interesting and what we as citizens and we as a government do have a role to play. So a thought experiment. Let's say you and I, Katie, are, are at one of these really large Fortune 500 publicly traded companies, right? And the conversation is, well, we need to be morally and ethically and legally sound with artificial intelligence. That's the right thing to do. And I want to commend all these companies and their ethics boards. It's, inc- it, it, I mean, truly, you know, bravo. At the same time, let's imagine we're in that room though. So you probably have 10 or 15 really, really awesome, bright people sitting there saying, I want to do the right thing. Inevitably, you get about three minutes into the conversation, like we have here. And it leads to, well, we have to share that data so it can be representative of those people. We have to share that algorithm so that, you know, we get rid of this whole, you're an Apple, I'm a droid, right? So that we can represent all and be ethically sound and do the right thing. And inevitably in that room is also general counsel from a really reputable, you know, institution like Stanford law attorney sits back there, raises his or her hand and says, "Mm, hold on one second. You have a fiduciary responsibility to your shareholder not to do that. Right. I mean, because that's your intellectual property. So as the conversation moves on, inevitably our own structure in some ways limits us. But who do we have a fiduciary responsibility to as citizens and as a government? Everyone, to everyone out there. So it calls for this reinvigoration of that conversation. Now, let's be clear as well, though. Very quickly, you could say, 
well, yeah, in that case, if we want AI to be fair, there shouldn't be an Apple. There shouldn't be a droid. There should just be one. Then all of a sudden you start looking like China with one platform like WeChat where people don't have options. So you can see the slippery slope that can happen very, very, very quickly. What it really means at the end of the day to the question you asked is you shouldn't throw the whole kitchen out the window, right? We, you know, there's still, there's still frameworks in place at work, even though we said the AI word, right? It's okay. But I think it's far time that we start, you know, carving out some new square pegs for, you know, or square holes for square pegs, not trying to fit it in. And that comes from being informed, or at least generally aware of the topic itself and the tertiary effects or, you know, secondary effects that could happen from, from doing one of these projects. And I think that that kind of, you know, wraps up, well, what do we need to think about right now? Absolutely. That question of what companies do with their data and who that who those actions benefit or harm is so complicated. And of course, it varies by company to company. We forget, you know, when you're not paying something, you are the product, right? <laughs> I mean, if you're not paying for that, you are the product to somebody else. We do. And, and I mean, we give up a lot of that in exchange for mm-hmm. personalization, right? Yep, welcome welcome to Amazon, Katie. Here are some recommendations for you. <laughs> yep, here's and some so, recommendations. Here's your, you know, uh, bunny face on, on TikTok. <laughs> Great. And uh, p- appreciate it, right? It's awesome. It's capability. But think about that conversation, though, to have someone exchange cost-free capability in their life and something that we're used to because somewhere down the chain, you're informing an algorithm, in, you know, keeping, uh, you know, Muslim Uyghurs at bay in China, right? I mean, if you are on that platform, vis-a-vis the AI is training on you, becoming more robust, and you can see how that long chain ends up panning out. That's an intellectually tough argument. You got to really understand how that could even happen. Could you dive into that example? Important. Can you dive into that a little bit more for folks who are listening who are less familiar with some of the implications? Sure. We we talked about the extent to which okay, we get more data means more algorithms, more robust, and more performant for whatever tasks they were meant to do. So when you're sitting on a platform, and for instance, you know. You, you put the bunny face on your face. Well, that's computer vision, right? I mean, AI is all around us. Literally, when you open your phone and it and you looks at your face for facial ID so that you have security and privacy to your phone, that's artificial intelligence. But let's imagine, though, that perhaps that's a company's phone that you don't quite agree with, Right that doesn't quite see the world or their culture the same way you do yours. Well, interestingly enough, remember back to that data point, you're training that artificial intelligence, right? You're making it more robust. And then you have to ask the question, well, tell me what perhaps a company like Baidu, Alibaba, Tencent, or whatever it is, is doing with that stuff. And you might find out after you go down the long chain well, I actually don't like that. That's compromising someone else in the world. So that gets to the point too, that everyone should be involved in a conversation. As a consumer, to a developer, to a supplier, you're you're a part of the AI chain in some ways. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And that's why we want to be able to have, uh, you know, foundationally robust intelligent, uh, intelligent conversation on the topic. Absolutely. Thank you so much for pointing that out. You know, as everyday consumers or citizens, we have a stake in this game as innovation teams, we have a stake in this game. And and like you said, maybe it's not to take full responsibility for every misuse or use case that emerges after we've created something, but to have that conversation and to our best knowledge, try to anticipate that as innovation leaders and communicate that up the chain as we try to get buy-in for new projects and ideas. It's quite critical that you spend a little bit of time at least articulating what those other use cases might be, or at least seeking 
you know, the opinions of experts who can help you think through that. And we can't always know. That's what's so challenging. But we, we do our best to present, uh, you know, to, to work with the ethics we have in front of us, the decisions we have in front of us. You're right. We can't always know. And that's OK. We're going to make mistakes. The question is, did you have the right kind of intent? Did you do due diligence, right? Can you stand in front of someone and say, well, that had a side effect I did not realize, but here's how we mitigated it and thought about it. And now we'll change, right? And that, that's yeah. okay. It's okay. I Dive in, dive into using AI in safe spaces. If you got a lot of Excel files, you can use machine learning, right? <laughs> <laughs> yes, absolutely. If you got a lot. Of, if you got a lot of financial data, you could use it. You know, there's something for everyone. <laughs> Definitely. And I know we've talked a lot about data and numbers, but at Untold, we often talk about data storytelling too. And so, can you share with us some of your thoughts around storytelling, the role that it plays in AI and its success, or or not? Storytelling is one of the most important things, and it's something special about humanity, that we can communicate stories, that we can imagine ourselves in the foot, in the feet of others, in the shoes of others, without necessarily depicting it per se or experiencing it. For instance, if I describe to you, there is a woman running down the street with a bucket of water, right? And it is splashing everywhere. Perhaps you've never done that. Maybe you have. But you're like, oh, I can imagine that, right? Storytelling creates buy-in and it creates experiences that we can understand and are, and are meaningful to us. And I think stories, like reading, is important too. And I mean dedicated reading and storytelling, right? So I think back to seminal books in my life. There works like If You Give a Mouse a Cookie or Where the <laughs> Wild Things Are or maybe Good Night Moon. And I know, I know I'm referencing some children's books, but don't worry, I'm going. It's, it's, it's fully half of my professional life right now as uh, <laughs> we live at home with COVID and work from home uh, it is all of the books you just said with my one, four and five-year-olds. <laughs> oh, wow. Uh, these are the best books, right? Those are my favorites. Oh, yeah. But there are also books like Sagan's Cosmos, Hawking's University, Universe in a Nutshell, or, you know, when I was 10 years old, bring, reading Brian Greene's The Elegant Universe over and over again. <laughs> maybe most recently Harari Sapiens or something. Their favorites like Tolstoy, Virginia Woolf, you know, Huxley, and so many more. And these books and storytelling have something in common. People since the dawn of language, learning, and eventual writing have debated and discussed consciousness, theories of physics, biology, social realities, technologies, and all the rest of the things that constitute the human experience. The average person hears about them. Shoot, I mean, we experience them every day and we know of those words, but not always what those words mean. Essentially for every topic, they're brought to light, but storytelling brings something to life and it inspires more. And I think that's a distinction with a difference. So I look back and think of learning, which is really what we're talking about here, right? Learning through storytelling. I think it's centered around dialogues. Maybe that's with someone else or others, but maybe that's with yourself too, the internal one that's really important. And for me, when we talk about AI, the concepts of consciousness, experience, social order, biology, the whole human story is brought together in the story of AI. Now, when we talk about innovation, right, which is, that's my personal innovation, we want to tell stories so that they can experience that idea, take the aspects of it that mean something to them, right? Don't run down the street with that bucket full of water, walk, right? That's, that's a lesson, you know, that, that we can take away. Just like when we tell the story of, you know, an innovative group or the creation of the post-it note or whatever it may yeah. be for you, there are things you can take away. And that is the value of storytelling to innovation. Thank you. Yes, absolutely. Yeah, I really appreciate those uh, those points. And it's absolutely, it's about buy-in, about creating an experience, about drawing upon the human capability for empathy. Uh, 
and just to wrap up our conversation, because I, I know we could talk all day. This has been wonderful, and I'm so grateful. I, it's fascinating to me, again, this idea of the mirror and the way that we need to think a little bit differently when we're considering what applications to to create with AI. And it's this change of mindset a little bit. It, it really, it's interesting. It's an interesting position for innovators to have to be in because on one hand, you need to think of how are we going to create the right circumstances for a computer to learn? And that's very different than the way that a human learns, at least to some degree, right? Around data and putting in this data set. And then we also still have to storytell to other humans to get buy-in for those efforts and to get feedback and to refine the approach and think about it, the impact it could have and, and how it's going to help better people's lives in whatever way that means. And so it's not an easy job to be someone who is innovating with AI right now. Um, but I think that not just being really smart at working with data and building algorithms, also being able to be a storyteller is what I'm hearing from you. That's all still critical to the success of AI innovation. It's so renaissance, right? You got <laughs> you to you think you, you, you have to become the renaissance woman or man right now. You yeah. have to the whole kit and caboodle, writing and storytelling and, and, and technical proficiency, or at least to the extent that you can see what's going on. And I, I, when, when you're bringing this up, I was thinking of, of the underlying theme of storytelling. And it's a quote from Einstein. And he's often attributed with saying, you don't really understand something unless you can explain it to your grandmother. And I think that's true. But if Einstein knew my own grandmother, he would have altered his words slightly and a more precise adage would be, your grandmother is likely the smartest person you'll ever encounter. So if she doesn't understand your explanation, it's sure no one else will either. That's right. I love it. Thank you for that. And her. that, is, that, that <laughs> can be a theme to every aspect of our lives, every aspect of business, this connectedness uh, and an ability to storytell. Incredible. Thank you. Thank you so much, Michael. I really, really enjoyed your book. I know listeners will too. And I really enjoyed this conversation. And uh, thank you for flipping that quote on its head. It's really lovely. I'm glad we could end on that note. Thanks, Katie. It was awesome to be with you today. Talk to you soon. Bye. Thanks for listening to this week's episode. Be sure to follow us on social media and add your voice to the conversation. You can find us at Untold Content. 